that's a, a very short, a, a, a lot of girl in a, in a few years for us. And so let me tell you a little bit about how she got sick. It was very normal. I mean, it was routine. Uh, we're young parents with young family and she just came home and, and was a little bit tired. So we took her to the pediatrician. Uh, I think this is a Thursday and the pediatrician did a nasal swab and said, okay, she's got flu. And we said, okay, what do we do? And she said, well, she's gonna be, a, you know, this flu is, you get pretty sick, so don't expect her just to pop up in a couple of days. She'll run fevers and, and, you know, feel bad and kind of get, you know, be lethargic and low energy. And here's what you have to watch out for. And so we went home uh, and thought, man, that's inconvenient. You know, we're kind of busy right now. Who has time to have someone down with the flu? Um, and so through the weekend, she, that's exactly what we saw. We saw her up, you know, you saw her on the couch with her brother and she'd be watching cartoons. Then she would be tired and running more of a high fever. And then, so it was kind of like this. And on Sunday, always on weekends with kids, right? Um, she seemed like she was worse. And this was Super Bowl Sunday. And in the mid-afternoon, we kind of said, you know, yeah, she looks kind of puny. Uh, and we ended up calling and saying, well, should we take her in? You know, should we not? If, should we go? No, no one's open. We'll have to go to the emergency room. This was a little bit before there was a freezing emergency department on every single corner that you turned on. So, uh, you know, that was the regular emergency department that was a long, long wait. Uh, that was f what we would have to do. We called her pediatrician. It took a while to call back. And by then she was looking good again. And the pediatrician said, well, you know, from what you told me, just watch and why don't you bring her in Monday? So bring her in tomorrow and we'll take a look at her. And if there's anything that needs to be done, we'll do it. So we said, okay. That night, it, she, it, was, a, it was a tough night for her. She, you know, she was throwing up uh, just, you know, more of a fever, just seemed sicker overall. So I kind of felt, you know, I didn't get a ton of sleep. My wife was pregnant. Uh, very, very pregnant, due, you know, within, you know, a week or so uh, with our fourth child. So I stayed home from work because my wife could not carry Emily, being pregnant, uh, to, to go to the doctor. And in the morning, gave her a shower. Uh, she kind of laid on the bed and watched cartoons. And around probably 1030 or so, um, I heard my wife start screaming upstairs. And what had happened is Emily was laying in, in our bed, in our room, and kind of on her side, and my wife had gone in to, sometimes when you look and you just feel their back, and she, she found that she had stopped breathing. And we didn't know how long I mean, it could have been moments, it could have been, you know, it couldn't have been very long because we'd been in and out of the room. So we did CPR and called the paramedics right away and they got there. It, 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 a lot of that is a blur. Uh, you know, there's just a, f a few kind of sharp memories that I have. But I do remember my son, Andrew, coming in and watching all this. And I remember him asking if she was going to die. So that started a really long day for us where we went to the emergency department. They were able to get her heart started again. Um, we were transferred to the children's hospital. Um, and then it was just a full on swarm of of, it was, you know, 
20 people in her room doing everything that they could. Um, when I look back now, and we had hope. I mean, we were hopeful. When, when they got our hearts started again, we were like, okay, good, we're moving the right direction. You know, we're gonna, you know, this is gonna turn out okay. But looking back, I see the clues uh, in how the medical team talked to us about things. Um, and anyway, around later that night, Probably was about 10:30, so we had a you know we were there all day. Friends started coming in, family started coming in, but the doctor came to me and he said, "Hey," and he pulled me aside and he said, "We've reached the limit. You know everything we've done, we can't put any more drugs into her, um, and we can't see any activity. Uh, there's no brain activity." you know, what do you want us to do? And we started talking about this, and I don't know why he picked me, but maybe I was like the, the person that he felt he could talk to. And, and then my wife and I started talking about this, and, and we ultimately we agreed that, you know, it, it was time to say goodbye. And so we did. This is one of very few things that I would run into my house in a fire to, to save. Because this is a cast about a, about a week um, after we lost Emily. We got a box from the hospital and they had taken this cast of her hand. And if you look at it, you can actually see that there, you know, some of the medical tape is on there. Um, It's just, it's weird the things that make such a difference to you, I think. Um, so after, after we lost Emily, um, probably what seemed like it was terrible timing, but was a very good thing for us was our daughter was born. 13 days later. And when you can't wallow in your own pity and you have somebody else to, to focus on other than yourself, it turns out to be a very good thing. Uh, having responsibility, you can't curl up in a ball and just avoid things. And uh, she helped our entire family, I think, heal. Um, and she was uh, her own person, very different, um, very smart and mischievous, uh, very protected by our family. Um, and so we spent, I think, those, that time of healing for us, um, you know, she really, really helped us get through that three months, you know, four months. But in my head, I was burning with this question of, initially I thought, okay, when we get her autopsy back, they're going to tell me that she had something wrong, that cancer or something that we didn't know about that would allow influenza to kill her. Because I, I just... You know, I couldn't compute that. It didn't make sense to me. Um, and w she was perfectly healthy. And when we got the results back, and I started, you know, this was the thing that I just started, I couldn't let it go because, you know, I, it, I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that, you know, we lost our daughter. How could this thing, you know, have taken her that we were ill-prepared for, that we didn't know about? Um, and so during this time period, I had started, really, I started talking to physicians. I, you know, would, I brought all her medical record and I would go to infectious disease doctors at children's hospitals. I started talking to, uh, I would read papers from researchers and then I'd call them up. And, and uh, it's how I met some people at the CDC who 
I'll say as an aside, for busy, busy people, I certainly, they gave a lot of attention and very long emails to just a, a dad calling up out of the blue uh, about this. So, so some really good people there. So we embarked and we started in 2005, we, we started uh, an organization with other parents called Families Fighting Flu. Because after about four or five months, we realized that the thing that we could have done was to make sure she was vaccinated. That that was the thing that we could have done as parents that we did not do. Um, that probably would have saved her life. Um, for those of you that have been around this, you know, in immunization and policy and things like that for a long time, uh, we really focused in the early years in 2005, once we got some structure in our organization, we focused on kids. So the year that my daughter died, 2003, 2004, that flu season, there was a lot of children that died. About 100, over 150 died. And that changed a lot of things. It started, started a wave of reporting pediatric deaths. So I think the, the, around the country as a requirement. But at the time, Emily was three, and vaccine, flu vaccine, was only recommended for children who were immune compromised or sick or who were between the ages of six months and two years old. So that's all the recommendation covered for pediatrics. So a lot of what we focused on was universal vaccination uh, in the early years. And so we, you know, this was vaccinate your kids to protect them okay, to parents. I did countless interviews. We, uh, we started raising money. We started partnering to do uh, different kinds of education programs. But the message was, do this to protect your children be so that what happened to Emily doesn't happen to your child. Very simple. It's like a suit of armor. And we did a lot of different things. And so we, we were fortunate to, um, we were, I think, lucky that we were able to raise a, a fairly significant amount of money. Uh, we were fortunate in the kinds of partners that we met as we started to work and different members worked around the country, uh, the different kinds of programs. Um, and I mean, we've tried everything. There were, there's a race car, a NASCAR painted with a thing we did with Clorox back eight years ago. I mean, we still will. We'll try anything and, and if we think it'll make a difference. And, and our, unfortunately, our organization grew. Um, we're over 35 families now. Uh, and I've probably talked to 100 other parents who have lost children to flu, who for one reason or another, advocacy is not for them. You know, it's... So we worked a little bit in Texas, and I, and I, and I will say that we, you know, over the years, again, because this has been a long journey, that once we had universal flu recommendations, the challenge is getting parents to actually do it. Um, and so, uh, our role, the role we try to play is in kind of being the message bearers, being someone that can help get attention, that can kind of, okay, that's going to prompt the parent to make sure they have the discussion with their uh, healthcare provider or go in or it's busy during this time of year and teenagers are running all over the place, make sure they get in. So education, education, education. So, in 2007, our daughter, who you met, Allie, was diagnosed with cancer. And she didn't get the terrible, terrible go straight to bone marrow transplant cancer. Um, but she didn't get the 95, very sort of routine pass. She, was, she had leukemia. Um, and this was a tough time for us, but I remember when we got the diagnosis, 
And what happens in cancer, which a lot of people don't, with at least with kids, is I always thought that, well, if something like that happened, being who I am, I will go on the internet, I will spend 400 hours talking to all my friends and researching and figuring out who has the very best outcomes for what I'm doing, and then I will go there. So if that's MD Anderson, if that's St. Jude's, you know, that's how I thought about it. But how it actually works is a little different um, in that f in her case, and in, in a lot of kids, when they diagnose them, part of the diagnosis for leukemia is opening up and doing a spinal tap. And when they do that, they need to put chemotherapy on there. So you're right there. The outcomes are better if they immediately treat. So we were sort of thrown into this, but the oncologist said to my wife and I, he said, you're strangely calm about this. And we said, well, the worst thing's already happened to us. And we lost a daughter um, in this hospital. This, we feel like we can do something about. Um, so we're optimistic. It's not the worst thing that happened to us. And she went through a very, I mean, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to spend too much time on, on cancer, but um, it was 17 months of constant chemotherapy, um, lots of hospitalizations. We probably drove 6,000 miles a year back and forth to the hospital. Uh, you can see how fat she would become when she had steroids. I mean, it would just, 40% of her body weight, she would go up and then she'd go rail thin, you know, in the, in the very next cycle. So the, the, this is happening, each phase going, and there's no breaks. There's no breaks in the beginning. So it's constant, constant, constant. And she had what they call a double path because she failed induction therapy. So she had a double strength chemo path um, that, the, that the evidence showed that she needed to have. She had shingles for six months during that treatment and wouldn't go away, kidney stones, you name it. There's tons of things. As an example, I asked the hospital to look up her medical record and I said, we've seen so many people, so many people have cared for her. How many people did it take to get one kid better? Luckily they did this. I, I'm kind of active in the hospital. I don't know that they would do the work for a lot of people. Um, it turned out that it was over 260 nurses and physicians and caregivers that she had in her medical record there. Over, over I think it was just, just less than three years. That's how many. That's shocking. Now, it's not so shocking to me, but it may be shocking to some of you to think that's how many people had to touch one patient, a cancer patient, to, to actually get her through that journey. Um, so cancer, for us, and, and I'll, I'll let you know that we got very lucky, and this is my daughter today or recently, that she is, uh, she's in a magnet program She's uh, a very good athlete, volleyball player, plays on a, on a kind of highly ranked club. So we got lucky and we got, and so far we, we didn't have any of the heart effects. We didn't have some of the, there's a chemo carries a huge burden for children and, and we dodged all of those. But one of the things that happened to us in the very beginning of treatment, she had to be isolated. She was at home, she was little. But after you get through that first year, they're saying, okay, you gotta get them back in school. You can't keep them in a bubble. They have to, you know, they have to live their lives. And so we were faced with this challenge. I mean, I, back when she was immune compromised, I could, if someone coughed a mile away, I, I, you know, I could zone right to someone sneezing or coughing. I mean, you're that sensitive to what's going on. If we went to a restaurant, we brought Clorox and we wiped everything down on there. One time we had to take a plane ride and we brought sheets and we decked the whole thing, you know, covered up. I mean, you just don't want, everything is like danger, danger. And so uh, we were faced with when she had to go back to school, all of a sudden uh, we were going into preschool and 
because of our work with influenza, we started talking to people and finding out, well, gosh, people, there are people that don't vaccinate their kids. And uh, you would read about, oh, there's a measles outbreak in Washington State or somewhere. And it was always around kids that weren't vaccinated. So flu, 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 all about flu for us. But in our case, we started as we put her back in school and I ended up having to go down and testify in Austin as they were talking about healthcare practitioners because there was a bill, wasn't too many years ago, that they were passing legislation in Texas that would require hospital and healthcare workers all to get flu vaccination. Uh, they, and, and this was in, in, in our institution where we were, they were already doing that. So my, my daughter, uh, before they were required, it was you know pretty clear and certainly absolutely required in on oncology on fifth floor where we were. Um, so I went down in support of that, but, but as we were putting her in school, we reached out to the principal and we said, hey, we know you can't tell us who, but c can you do us a favor? Um, can you make sure that if, if we have parents that kids that aren't vaccinated and you know who they are, um, can you please not put Allie in class with them? You know, how, how do we, you know, you don't know who the friends are. I don't ask my friends whether they vaccinate their kids. I don't choose my children's friends based on the answer that some parents provide about whether they're fully vaccinated. So that really, that really struck a chord with us that, um, that our daughter was vulnerable and we couldn't vaccinate her. As it turned out, when she was done with chemotherapy, we had to actually vaccinate her over again for many things. So we, they, when they did the titers, they found that the chemotherapy um, had kind of knocked some of the, you know, she wasn't at the therapeutic level of titers on some of her vaccines. So she ended up getting uh, revaccinated on a few of them and, and fully brought up to speed. But when she couldn't be, you know, we were in this position of, wait a second, we're now part of that group that depends on everybody else doing what they're supposed to doing, all the other parents protecting their kids. Um, and it was scary. Uh, and it's scary to me when I think about other, other parents out there of kids who are, maybe it's cancer or something else, and you see some stats in certain places around our state where you know, certain schools have very high rates of unvaccinated people, it's, it's scary. Um, one of the things that's always bothered me about doing this is that, and maybe this is something that y'all, you're on the front lines here, it is are you making a difference? You know, um, we've always wondered, we've seen, at least with, with influenza vaccination rates, we've seen those kind of creep up around the country, at, mostly because of access and recommendations. Um, but we hope a little bit because we're out there with the message and, and we have people and people like you are, are directly talking and educating. And in 2015, this is the first time I saw something. And this was published in Vaccine Magazine. And there was some data on influenza vaccination. And what the, I'll, I'll bottom line it for you because some of you may have already read this article, but the bottom line is that when you look at these, I think nine seasons, that they estimated that, the, that vaccination had saved over 320 children's lives. And this was the first time I saw something like this, that they actually had the data that could empirically show that these are the number of lives that our vaccine program saved. And we're talking about maybe 70%, I think is really, when we get to 70% of the total population in flu, that's really successful. I don't, I don't know that I've seen north of that um, ever. But here's the opportunity in Texas. So, that, so that's, that's some of the good information. But when you look at the last nine seasons in Texas, this is from DISH's data. We've lost 145 kids to influenza. 145 in Texas. So clearly, you know, that's 18 a year, and, there's, and I think the low year in there was eight. 
So I've never had the thing that I want to see, which is how do we get, how do we get to zero? Can we get to zero? Or how do we get to 100% of all the children vaccinated in Texas? This really bothers me. It's something that, you know, uh, if I on one day look and say, wow, we're doing great. We've saved lives. What we do is meaningful. And then on the other day, it's, gosh, this is like trying to boil the ocean. You know, there's, you know, it's every time you do whack-a-mole and you knock something down, then something pops up and um, it's a little bit crazy. I do have a couple of ideas. Um, I do think parents are the key. I do think that flu uh, is a little bit harder maybe because there's some, you know, it's, you have to do it every year. Uh, maybe some has to do with the timing. Um, one of the things that you need to do is that I've noticed that people, parents are not always scared of the things they should be scared about. Uh, so. For example, I don't know if you have this in your area, but we have lots of crazy clown sightings now, this phobia that's going around America. Um, in Dallas, we had, everybody remembers Ebola. And you wouldn't believe the depths what people would go to with Ebola, how frightened they were of Ebola, of schools closing and all these kinds of things. But we have 100, we've, we've lost 145 children to flu over nine years. And if, if we would simply, you know, if it would get as much coverage as these stupid clowns running around the, the country, uh, now they are scary by that. By the, I, I actually don't like clowns that much. I'm going to change that. Um, so, but, but these clowns aren't doing anything. They're just running around. So a couple of ideas that I have, and I want to kind of, I want to leave with, with a few things that I've been thinking about. Number one, um, I think maybe we could move the needle further if we tied flu vaccination to somehow to participation in UIL sports. So I've been thinking about this for a while. I haven't, I haven't uh, really started anything or approached any lawmakers about this, but you know, we, as my kids have played, and I'm sure many other you know, parents here have had children that play sports or band or something else, that's governed under UIL. We have huge participation in Texas in athletics. Uh, you already require them to have a visit where they go and they have to get certified. I think we there's some things in there about concussion protocols now, which rightfully so. I think there's some things about uh, sudden cardiac death, certain things that are in that. So why not put flu vaccination uh, in the requirement? The timing's kind of right. You know, maybe not perfect because of when vaccine's available. So there are some challenges, but that's one idea. And I wonder if that could get us another 10%. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll get us 10%. Maybe it'll get us 12%. I don't know. Um, another thing I've thought about, I work for a hospital system. And everywhere I drive, all there's so many billboards. And I am in DFW. There's, every, there's hospital billboards everywhere. Um, and I wonder if maybe in October, and we could do this everywhere, I'm sure we could get the Texas Hospital Association to at least think about this, would all the hospitals change their billboard at the same time? So imagine how, however number, I don't know the number of billboards, maybe there's a 2,000 that hospitals own. Would they all change to the same one that talks about flu season, flu vaccination, protect Texas, I, I, whatever it is. It, you know, smart people will come up with what, you know, what that, the messaging should be or something compelling. But the fact is, to me, it's the number of impressions that you get. Because I think flu vaccination is one of those things too where as I talk to parents, we've never ever really worried too much about you know, the fraction of a percent that s under no circumstances whatsoever will ever get their kid a flu shot because they're adamantly opposed to it or they're opposed to the government telling them what to do, whatever. That's just a tiny bit. You know, when we talk to parents, for the most part, it's about, it's one of two things. It's either, I'm busy, 
I would probably do it, but I'm running around and I'm doing here and I'm taking my kids to this, you know, four sporting events and school's doing this and or I'm a single dad or I'm a single mother and I'm and, and it's time or it's influenza, the flu, well, you know, why do I worry about that? That's no big deal. Um, they have no idea how many people die from influenza every year. They just don't. And that's how I used to be. Uh, I think of, you know, before losing my daughter, that was, we were naive. We were, um, we were right in that group. I would, my, my kids, I, they would wear their seatbelts, they would wear their life jackets, we would get them out of the pool. This gets me. We, I've never heard of anyone, and maybe it, it happens, I need to re really research this, but how many people have been killed in a pool struck by lightning? I don't know, but I get my kids out of the water when there's lightning, you know? And uh, even, the, I don't know what that risk is. So I, I think that uh, those two things, you know, that education, that flu is important enough of a threat to protect your kids, and that seeing the message, the reminders, enough reminders, if, if you see it 50 times and it's in that moment when there's vaccine, eventually you'll go, oh, okay, I gotta do that. You know, it may be, for some people it takes 10 times, some people it takes 20 times. So those are, those are two, I, I don't know if they're great ideas, I don't know if they're bad ideas, they're just my ideas about how maybe we can move the needle a little bit further on flu vaccination. I want to close um, with a few comments that I think in 2005, the first interview that I did was we did a, um, my wife and I did an interview with uh, Diane Sawyer on flu. I've probably done hundreds and hundreds, uh, you know, since then. Um, one of the other things that I learned about this, so, is I never knew how many people were working at the grassroots level in public health departments, in collaboratives, in uh, different kinds of community efforts. I've been in, I don't know, maybe a dozen states uh, at the state level or in, at a county level or some sort of amalgamation. And I had no idea that it took that many dedicated people to, to protect uh, our kids. Um, I mean, literally thousands. So I know that a lot of people don't know or and probably don't appreciate how important uh, the work is that all of y'all do, but I do. I didn't before, but I know that it's, uh, it's probably somewhat thankless. Uh, I don't know that there's a lot of badges or heroes or rewards. Um, I don't suppose that, I'm gonna guess that, you know, on show and tell day, you know, it's, it's easier to be the firefighter or something fun and cool than it is to, you know, bring mom in or dad in and say, what do they do? Well, we, we help kids get immunized or we work here, or we work at this thing. But um, I think that vaccines are maybe one of the biggest home runs that we've ever had in public health and as we, um, and I, I worry about losing that a little bit and it's not obvious and it's not easy and it's, it's lots of little conversations with people that don't know about it or are concerned or have barriers, whether they're driving or economic or access. I mean, these are all things that we need to continue to make sure that um, our population is protected. So I, want to say thank you, that I'm at least one person, uh, including everybody here, but who's sort of not in this space, 
does really appreciate all the hard work that every one of y'all does. Um, and it makes a difference. And there's not a lot of studies that show that, but it does say I'm convinced that it saves lives, a lot of lives. So thank you very much. Um, I'll answer, I think I'm a little early, so I'll answer some questions uh, if there are any or out there. But thank you for having me. Um, have a good conference.